Cyrus II of Persia, Old Persian, Kurus, New Persian, Kursh Kurus, Hebrew, Kurs Modern, Kores, Tiberian, Kores, c. 600 to 530 BC, commonly known as Cyrus the Great and also called Cyrus the Elder by the Greeks, was the founder of the Achaemenid Empire, the first Persian Empire. Under his rule, the empire embraced all the previous civilized states of the ancient Near East, expanded vastly and eventually conquered most of Southwest Asia and much of Central Asia and the Caucasus. From the Mediterranean Sea and Hellespont in the west to the Indus River in the east, Cyrus the Great created the largest empire the world had yet seen. Under his successors, the empire eventually stretched at its maximum extent from parts of the Balkans Bulgaria Paeonia and Thrace Macedonia and Eastern Europe proper in the west, to the Indus Valley in the east. His regal titles in full were the Great King, King of Persia, King of Anshan, King of Media, King of Babylon, King of Sumer and Akkad, and King of the Four Corners of the World. The Nabonidus Chronicle notes the change in his title from simply, King of Anshan, a city, to King of Persia. Assyriologist François Vallet wrote that, When Astyages marched against Cyrus, Cyrus is called King of Anshan, but when Cyrus crosses the Tigris on his way to Lydia, he is King of Persia. The coup therefore took place between these two events. The reign of Cyrus the Great lasted c. 30 years. Cyrus built his empire by first conquering the Median Empire, then the Lydian Empire, and eventually the Neo Babylonian Empire. He led an expedition into Central Asia, which resulted in major campaigns that were described as having brought into subjection every nation without exception. Cyrus did not venture into Egypt, and was alleged to have died in battle, fighting the Masajti along the Syr Darya in December 530 BC. He was succeeded by his son, Cambyses II, who managed to conquer Egypt, Nubia, and Cyrenaica during his short rule. Cyrus the Great respected the customs and religions of the lands he conquered. This became a very successful model for centralized administration and establishing a government working to the advantage and profit of its subjects. In fact, the administration of the empire through satraps and the vital principle of forming a government at Pasargadae were the works of Cyrus. What is sometimes referred to as the Edict of Restoration actually two edicts described in the Bible as being made by Cyrus the Great left a lasting legacy on the Jewish religion, where, because of his policies in Babylonia, he is referred to by the Jewish Bible as Messiah lit. His Anointed One. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 1, and is the only non-Jewish figure in the Bible to be called so. Cyrus the Great is also well recognized for his achievements in human rights, politics, and military strategy, as well as his influence on both Eastern and Western civilizations. Having originated from Persis, roughly corresponding to the modern Iranian province of Fars, Cyrus has played a crucial role in defining the national identity of modern Iran. The Achaemenid influence in the ancient world eventually would extend as far as Athens, where upper-class Athenians adopted aspects of the culture of the ruling class of Achaemenid Persian as their own. In the 1970s, the last Shah of Iran Muhammad Reza Pahlavi identified his famous proclamation inscribed onto the Cyrus Cylinder as the oldest known declaration of human rights, and the cylinder has since been popularized as such. This view has been criticized by some historians as a misunderstanding of the cylinder's generic nature as a traditional statement that new monarchs make at the beginning of their reign. Topic. Background Topic. Topic. Etymology Topic. The name Cyrus is a Latinized form derived from the Greek kairos, kairos, itself from the Old Persian kurus. The name and its meaning has been recorded in ancient inscriptions in different languages. The ancient Greek historians Tejas and Plutarch noted that Cyrus was named from kouros, the sun, a concept which has been interpreted as meaning, like the sun, kurvash, by noting its relation to the Persian noun for sun, kor, while using vash as a suffix of likeness. This may also point to a relationship to the mythological first king of Persia, Jamshid, whose name also incorporates the element sun, shid. Karl Hoffman has suggested a translation based on the meaning of an Indo-European root, to humiliate, and accordingly, Cyrus, means, humiliator of the enemy in verbal contest. In the Persian language and especially in Iran, Cyrus's name is spelled as Quersh 
In the Bible, he is known as Koresh Hebrew. Topic: <laughs> Dynastic history. Topic: the Persian domination and kingdom in the Iranian plateau started by an extension of the Achaemenid dynasty, who expanded their earlier domination possibly from the 9th century BC onward. The eponymous founder of this dynasty was Achaemenes from Old Persian Hoxamanis. Achaemenids are descendants of Achaemenes, as Darius the Great, the ninth king of the dynasty, traces his genealogy to him and declares, "For this reason we are called Achaemenids." Achaemenes built the state Parsumash in the southwest of Iran and was succeeded by Tysps, who took the title, King of Anshan, after seizing Anshan city and enlarging his kingdom further to include Pars proper. Ancient documents mention that Tysps had a son called Cyrus I, who also succeeded his father as, King of Anshan. Cyrus I had a full brother whose name is recorded as Ariaramnas. In 600 BC, Cyrus I was succeeded by his son, Cambyses I, who reigned until 559 BC. Cyrus the Great was a son of Cambyses I, who named his son after his father, Cyrus I. There are several inscriptions of Cyrus the Great and later kings that refer to Cambyses I as the Great King and King of Anshan. Among these are some passages in the Cyrus Cylinder where Cyrus calls himself son of Cambyses, great king, king of Anshan. Another inscription from CM S mentions Cambyses I as mighty king and an Achaemenian, which according to the bulk of scholarly opinion was engraved under Darius and considered as a later forgery by Darius. However Cambyses II's maternal grandfather Pharnasps is named by Herodotus as an Achaemenian. Two. Xenophon account in Cyropedia further names Cambyses's wife as Mandane and mentions Cambyses as king of Iran ancient Persia. These agree with Cyrus's own inscriptions, as Anshan and Parsa were different names of the same land. These also agree with other non-Iranian accounts, except at one point from Herodotus stating that Cambyses was not a king but a Persian of good family. However, in some other passages, Herodotus S account is wrong also on the name of the son of Chishpish, which he mentions as Cambyses but, according to modern scholars, should be Cyrus I. The traditional view based on archaeological research and the genealogy given in the Behistun inscription and by Herodotus holds that Cyrus the Great was an Achaemenid. However it has been suggested by M. Waters that Cyrus is unrelated to the Achaemenids or Darius the Great and that his family was of Tyspid and Anchonite origin instead of Achaemenid. Early life Cyrus was born to Cambyses I, king of Anshan and Mandane, daughter of Astyages, king of Media during the period of 600–599 BC. By his own account, generally believed now to be accurate, Cyrus was preceded as king by his father Cambyses I, grandfather Cyrus I, and great-grandfather. Cyrus married Cassandane who was an Achaemenian and the daughter of Pharnasps who bore him two sons, Cambyses II and Bardia along with three daughters, Atossa, Artistone, and Roxanne. Cyrus and Cassandane were known to love each other very much, Cassandane said that she found it more bitter to leave Cyrus than to depart her life. After her death, Cyrus insisted on public mourning throughout the kingdom. The Nabonidus Chronicle states that Babylonia mourned Cassandane for six days identified from 21 to 26 March 538 BC. After his father's death, Cyrus inherited the Persian throne at Pasargadae which was a vassal of Astyages. It is also noted that Strabo has said that Cyrus was originally named Agridates by his step-parents, therefore, it is probable that, when reuniting with his original family, following the naming customs, Cyrus's father, Cambyses I, named him Cyrus after his grandfather, who was Cyrus I. Mythology <inaudible> 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 Herodotus gave a mythological account of Cyrus's early life. In this account, Astyages had two prophetic dreams in which a flood, and then a series of fruit-bearing vines, emerged from his daughter Mandane's pelvis, and covered the entire kingdom. These were interpreted by his advisors as a foretelling that his grandson would one day rebel and supplant him as king. 
Astyages summoned Mandane, at the time pregnant with Cyrus, back to Igbatana to have the child killed. Harpagus delegated the task to Mithridates, one of the shepherds of Astyages, who raised the child and passed off his stillborn son to Harpagus as the dead infant Cyrus. Cyrus lived in secrecy, but when he reached the age of ten, during a childhood game, he had the son of a nobleman beaten when he refused to obey Cyrus's commands. As it was unheard of for the son of a shepherd to commit such an act, Astyages had the boy brought to his court, and interviewed him and his adopted father. Upon the shepherd's confession, Astyages sent Cyrus back to Persia to live with his biological parents. However, Astyages summoned the son of Harpagus, and in retribution, chopped him to pieces, roasted some portions while boiling others, and tricked his advisor into eating his child during a large banquet. Following the meal, Astyages' servants brought Harpagus the head, hands and feet of his son on platters, so he could realize his inadvertent cannibalism. In another version, Cyrus was presented as the son of a poor family that worked in the Median court. Rise and military campaigns Topic. Topic. Median Empire Topic. Though his father died in 551 BC, Cyrus the Great had already succeeded to the throne in 559 BC, however, Cyrus was not yet an independent ruler. Like his predecessors, Cyrus had to recognize Median overlordship. Astyages, last king of the Median Empire and Cyrus' grandfather, may have ruled over the majority of the ancient Near East, from the Lydian frontier in the west to the Parthians and Persians in the east. According to the Nabonidus Chronicle, Astyages launched an attack against Cyrus, king of Anson. According to the historian Herodotus, it is known that Astyages placed Harpagus in command of the Median army to conquer Cyrus. However, Harpagus contacted Cyrus and encouraged his revolt against Media, before eventually defecting along with several of the nobility and a portion of the army. This mutiny is confirmed by the Nabonidus Chronicle. Babylonian texts suggest that the hostilities lasted for at least three years 553 to 550, and the final battle resulted in the capture of Igbatana. According to the historians Herodotus and Tejas, Cyrus spared the life of Astyages and married his daughter, Amytus. This marriage pacified several vassals, including the Bactrians, Parthians, and Saka. Herodotus notes that Cyrus also subdued and incorporated Sogdia into the empire during his military campaigns of 546 to 539 BC. With Astyages out of power, all of his vassals, including many of Cyrus's relatives, were now under his command. His uncle Arsames, who had been the king of the city-state of Parsa under the Medes, therefore would have had to give up his throne. However, this transfer of power within the family seems to have been smooth, and it is likely that Arsames was still the nominal governor of Parsa under Cyrus's authority—more a prince or a grand duke than a king. His son, Hystasps, who was also Cyrus's second cousin, was then made satrap of Parthia and Phrygia. Cyrus the Great thus united the twin Achaemenid kingdoms of Parsa and Anshan into Persia proper. Arsames lived to see his grandson become Darius the Great, Shahanshah of Persia, after the deaths of both of Cyrus's sons. Cyrus's conquest of Media was merely the start of his wars. Lydian Empire and Asia Minor The exact dates of the Lydian conquest are unknown, but it must have taken place between Cyrus. Overthrow of the Median Kingdom 550 BC and his conquest of Babylon 539 BC. It was common in the past to give 547 BC as the year of the conquest due to some interpretations of the Nabonidus Chronicle, but this position is currently not much held. The Lydians first attacked the Achaemenid Empire's city of Teria in Cappadocia. Croesus besieged and captured the city, enslaving its inhabitants. Meanwhile, the Persians invited the citizens of Ionia who were part of the Lydian kingdom to revolt against their ruler. The offer was rebuffed, and thus Cyrus levied an army and marched against the Lydians, increasing his numbers while passing through nations in his way. The Battle of Teria was effectively a stalemate, with both sides suffering heavy casualties by nightfall. 
Croesus retreated to Sardis the following morning, while in Sardis, Croesus sent out requests for his allies to send aid to Lydia. However, near the end of the winter, before the Allies could unite, Cyrus the Great pushed the war into Lydian territory and besieged Croesus in his capital, Sardis. Shortly before the final battle of Thymbra between the two rulers, Harpagus advised Cyrus the Great to place his dromedaries in front of his warriors. The Lydian horses, not used to the dromedaries' smell, would be very afraid. The strategy worked, the Lydian cavalry was routed. Cyrus defeated and captured Croesus. Cyrus occupied the capital at Sardis, conquering the Lydian kingdom in 546 BC. According to Herodotus, Cyrus the Great spared Croesus's life and kept him as an advisor, but this account conflicts with some translations of the contemporary Nabonidus Chronicle the king who was himself subdued by Cyrus the Great after conquest of Babylonia, which interpret that the king of Lydia was slain. Before returning to the capital, a Lydian named Pactias was entrusted by Cyrus the Great to send Croesus's treasury to Persia. However, soon after Cyrus's departure, Pactias hired mercenaries and caused an uprising in Sardis, revolting against the Persian satrap of Lydia, Tabalus. With recommendations from Croesus that he should turn the minds of the Lydian people to luxury, Cyrus sent Mazaras, one of his commanders, to subdue the insurrection but demanded that Pactias be returned alive. Upon Mazaras's arrival, Pactias fled to Ionia, where he had hired more mercenaries. Mazaras marched his troops into the Greek country and subdued the cities of Magnesia and Preen. The end of Pactias is unknown, but after capture, he was probably sent to Cyrus and put to death after a succession of tortures. Mazaras continued the conquest of Asia Minor but died of unknown causes during his campaign in Ionia. Cyrus sent Harpagus to complete Mazaras's conquest of Asia Minor. Harpagus captured Lycia, Cilicia, and Phoenicia, using the technique of building earthworks to breach the walls of besieged cities, a method unknown to the Greeks. He ended his conquest of the area in 542 BC and returned to Persia. Neo-Babylonian Empire By the year 540 BC, Cyrus captured Elam and its capital, Susa. The Nabonidus Chronicle records that, prior to the battles, Nabonidus had ordered cult statues from outlying Babylonian cities to be brought into the capital, suggesting that the conflict had begun possibly in the winter of 540 BC. Near the beginning of October 539 BC, Cyrus fought the Battle of Opus in or near the strategic riverside city of Opus on the Tigris, north of Babylon. The Babylonian army was routed, and on October 10, Sippar was seized without a battle, with little to no resistance from the populace. It is probable that Cyrus engaged in negotiations with the Babylonian generals to obtain a compromise on their part and therefore avoid an armed confrontation. Nabonidus was staying in the city at the time and soon fled to the capital, Babylon, which he had not visited in years. Two days later, on October 12, proleptic Gregorian calendar, Guberu. S troops entered Babylon, again without any resistance from the Babylonian armies, and detained Nabonidus. Herodotus explains that to accomplish this feat, the Persians, using a basin dug earlier by the Babylonian queen Natakris to protect Babylon against Median attacks, diverted the Euphrates River into a canal so that the water level dropped to the height of the middle of a man's thigh which allowed the invading forces to march directly through the river bed to enter at night. On October 29, Cyrus himself entered the city of Babylon and detained Nabonidus. Prior to Cyrus's invasion of Babylon, the Neo-Babylonian Empire had conquered many kingdoms. In addition to Babylonia itself, Cyrus probably incorporated its sub-national entities into his empire, including Syria, Judea, and Arabia Petraea, although there is no direct evidence of this fact. After taking Babylon, Cyrus the Great proclaimed himself King of Babylon, King of Sumer and Akkad, King of the Four Corners of the World in the famous Cyrus Cylinder, an inscription deposited in the foundations of the Esagila Temple dedicated to the chief Babylonian god, Marduk. The text of the cylinder denounces Nabonidus as impious and portrays the victorious Cyrus pleasing the god Marduk. It describes how Cyrus had improved the lives of the citizens of Babylonia, repatriated displaced peoples, and restored temples and cult sanctuaries. 
Although some have asserted that the cylinder represents a form of human rights charter, historians generally portray it in the context of a long standing Mesopotamian tradition of new rulers beginning their reigns with declarations of reforms. Cyrus the Great's dominions comprised the largest empire the world had ever seen. At the end of Cyrus' rule, the Achaemenid Empire stretched from Asia Minor in the west to the Indus River in the east. Death The details of Cyrus's death vary by account. The account of Herodotus from his histories provides the second longest detail, in which Cyrus met his fate in a fierce battle with the Masajti, a tribe from the southern deserts of Khwarezm and Kizil Kum in the southernmost portion of the steppe regions of modern-day Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, following the advice of Croesus to attack them in their own territory. The Masajti were related to the Scythians in their dress and mode of living, they fought on horseback and on foot. In order to acquire her realm, Cyrus first sent an offer of marriage to their ruler, the Empress Tomiris, a proposal she rejected. He then commenced his attempt to take Masajti territory by force ca. 529, beginning by building bridges and towered war boats along his side of the river Jaxarts, or Syr Darya, which separated them. Sending him a warning to cease his encroachment a warning which she stated she expected he would disregard anyway, Tomiris challenged him to meet her forces in honorable warfare, inviting him to a location in her country a day's march from the river, where their two armies would formally engage each other. He accepted her offer, but, learning that the massage tea were unfamiliar with wine and its intoxicating effects, he set up and then left camp with plenty of it behind, taking his best soldiers with him and leaving the least capable ones. The general of Tomiris's army, Spargapizes, who was also her son, and a third of the Massagetian troops, killed the group Cyrus had left there and, finding the camp well stocked with food and the wine, unwittingly drank themselves into inebriation, diminishing their capability to defend themselves when they were then overtaken by a surprise attack. They were successfully defeated, and, although he was taken prisoner, Spargapizes committed suicide once he regained sobriety. Upon learning of what had transpired, Tomiris denounced Cyrus's tactics as underhanded and swore vengeance, leading a second wave of troops into battle herself. Cyrus the Great was ultimately killed, and his forces suffered massive casualties in what Herodotus referred to as the fiercest battle of his career and the ancient world. When it was over, Tomiris ordered the body of Cyrus brought to her, then decapitated him and dipped his head in a vessel of blood in a symbolic gesture of revenge for his bloodlust and the death of her son. However, some scholars question this version, mostly because Herodotus admits this event was one of many versions of Cyrus. S. Death that he heard from a supposedly reliable source who told him no one was there to see the aftermath. Herodotus also recounts that Cyrus saw in his sleep the oldest son of Hystasps, Darius I, with wings upon his shoulders, shadowing with the one wing Asia, and with the other wing Europe. Archaeologist Sir Max Malawan explains this statement by Herodotus and its connection with the four winged bas relief figure of Cyrus the Great in the following way. Herodotus therefore, as I surmise, may have known of the close connection between this type of winged figure and the image of Iranian majesty, which he associated with a dream prognosticating the king's death before his last, fatal campaign across the Oxus. Muhammad Dandamayev says maybe Persians took back Cyrus body from the Masaj T, unlike what Herodotus claimed, according to the Chronicle of Michael the Syrian 1166 AD, Cyrus was killed by his wife Tomiris, queen of the Masaj T Maxada, in the 60th year of Jewish captivity, Tejas, in his Persica, has the longest account, which says Cyrus met his death while putting down resistance from the Derbas's infantry, aided by other Scythian archers and cavalry, plus Indians and their war elephants. According to him, this event took place northeast of the headwaters of the Syr Darya. An alternative account from Xenophon's Cyropedia contradicts the others, claiming that Cyrus died peaceably at his capital. The final version of Cyrus's death comes from Barassus, who only reports that Cyrus met his death while warring against the Dahai archers northwest of the headwaters of the Syr Darya. Burial. 
Cyrus the Great's remains may have been interred in his capital city of Pasargadae, where today a limestone tomb built around 540 to 530 BC still exists, which many believe to be his. Strabo and Arian give nearly identical descriptions of the tomb, based on the eyewitness report of Aristobulus of Cassandrea, who at the request of Alexander the Great visited the tomb twice. Though the city itself is now in ruins, the burial place of Cyrus the Great has remained largely intact, and the tomb has been partially restored to counter its natural deterioration over the centuries. According to Plutarch, his epitaph said, O man, whoever you are and wherever you come from, for I know you will come, I am Cyrus who won the Persians their empire. Do not therefore begrudge me this bit of earth that covers my bones. Cuneiform evidence from Babylon proves that Cyrus died around December 530 BC, and that his son Cambyses II had become king. Cambyses continued his father's policy of expansion, and captured Egypt for the empire, but soon died after only seven years of rule. He was succeeded either by Cyrus's other son Bardia or an impostor posing as Bardia, who became the sole ruler of Persia for seven months, until he was killed by Darius the Great. The translated ancient Roman and Greek accounts give a vivid description of the tomb both geometrically and aesthetically. The tomb's geometric shape has changed little over the years, still maintaining a large stone of quadrangular form at the base, followed by a pyramidal succession of smaller rectangular stones, until after a few slabs, the structure is curtailed by an edifice, with an arched roof composed of a pyramidal shaped stone, and a small opening or window on the side, where the slenderest man could barely squeeze through. Within this edifice was a golden coffin resting on a table with golden supports, inside of which the body of Cyrus the Great was interred. Upon his resting place, was a covering of tapestry and drapes made from the best available Babylonian materials, utilizing fine median worksmanship. Below his bed was a fine red carpet, covering the narrow rectangular area of his tomb. Translated Greek accounts describe the tomb as having been placed in the fertile Pasargadae gardens, surrounded by trees and ornamental shrubs, with a group of Achaemenian protectors called the Magi, stationed nearby to protect the edifice from theft or damage. Years later, in the chaos created by Alexander the Great's invasion of Persia and after the defeat of Darius III, Cyrus the Great's tomb was broken into and most of its luxuries were looted. When Alexander reached the tomb, he was horrified by the manner in which the tomb was treated, and questioned the Magi and put them to court. On some accounts, Alexander decision to put the Magi on trial was more about his attempt to undermine their influence and his show of power in his newly conquered empire, than a concern for Cyrus's tomb. However, Alexander admired Cyrus, from an early age reading Xenophon's Cyropedia, which described Cyrus's heroism in battle and governance as a king and legislator. Regardless, Alexander the Great ordered Aristobulus to improve the tomb condition and restore its interior. Despite his admiration for Cyrus the Great, and his attempts at renovation of his tomb, Alexander had, six years previously 330 BC, sacked Persepolis, the opulent city that Cyrus may have chosen the site for, and either ordered its burning as an act of pro-Greek propaganda or set it on fire during drunken revels. The edifice has survived the test of time, through invasions, internal divisions, successive empires, regime changes, and revolutions. The last prominent Persian figure to bring attention to the tomb was Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, Shah of Iran, the last official monarch of Persia, during his celebrations of 2,500 years of monarchy. Just as Alexander the Great before him, the Shah of Iran wanted to appeal to Cyrus's legacy to legitimize his own rule by extension. United Nations recognizes the tomb of Cyrus the Great and Pasargadae as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Topic. Legacy Topic. British historian Charles Freeman suggests that, in scope and extent his achievements Cyrus ranked far above that of the Macedonian king, Alexander, who was to demolish the Achaemenid empire in the 320s but failed to provide any stable alternative. Cyrus has been a personal hero to many people, including Thomas Jefferson, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, and David Ben Gurion. The achievements of Cyrus the Great throughout antiquity are reflected in the way he is remembered today. His own nation, the Iranians, have regarded him as the father 
the very title that had been used during the time of Cyrus himself, by the many nations that he conquered, as according to Xenophon, and those who were subject to him, he treated with esteem and regard, as if they were his own children, while his subjects themselves respected Cyrus as their father. What other man but Cyrus, after having overturned an empire, ever died with the title of the father from the people whom he had brought under his power? For it is plain fact that this is a name for one that bestows, rather than for one that takes away. The Babylonians regarded him as the liberator. The Book of Ezra narrates a story of the first return of exiles in the first year of Cyrus, in which Cyrus boastfully proclaims, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord, the God of heaven, given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Ezra chapter 1 verse 2 Cyrus was distinguished equally as a statesman and as a soldier. Due in part to the political infrastructure he created, the Achaemenid Empire endured long after his death. The rise of Persia under Cyrus's rule had a profound impact on the course of world history. Iranian philosophy, literature and religion all played dominant roles in world events for the next millennium. Despite the Islamic conquest of Persia in the 7th century AD by the Islamic Caliphate, Persia continued to exercise enormous influence in the Middle East during the Islamic Golden Age, and was particularly instrumental in the growth and expansion of Islam. Many of the Iranian dynasties following the Achaemenid Empire and their kings saw themselves as the heirs to Cyrus the Great and have claimed to continue the line begun by Cyrus. However, there are different opinions among scholars whether this is also the case for the Sassanid dynasty. Alexander the Great was himself infatuated with and admired Cyrus the Great, from an early age reading Xenophon's Cyropedia, which described Cyrus's heroism in battle and governance and his abilities as a king and a legislator. During his visit to Pasargadae he ordered Aristobulus to decorate the interior of the sepulchral chamber of Cyrus's tomb, Cyrus's legacy has been felt even as far away as Iceland and colonial America. Many of the thinkers and rulers of classical antiquity as well as the Renaissance and Enlightenment era, and the forefathers of the United States of America sought inspiration from Cyrus the Great through works such as Cyropedia. Thomas Jefferson, for example, owned two copies of Cyropedia, one with parallel Greek and Latin translations on facing pages showing substantial Jefferson markings that signify the amount of influence the book has had on drafting the United States Declaration of Independence. According to Professor Richard Nelson Fry, Cyrus, whose abilities as conqueror and administrator Fry says are attested by the longevity and vigor of the Achaemenid Empire, held an almost mythic role among the Persian people similar to that of Romulus and Remus in Rome or Moses for the Israelites, with a story that follows in many details the stories of hero and conquerors from elsewhere in the ancient world. Fry writes, he became the epitome of the great qualities expected of a ruler in antiquity, and he assumed heroic features as a conqueror who was tolerant and magnanimous as well as brave and daring. His personality as seen by the Greeks influenced them and Alexander the Great, and, as the tradition was transmitted by the Romans, may be considered to influence our thinking even now." On another account, Professor Patrick Hunt states, "...if you are looking at the greatest personages in history who have affected the world, Cyrus the Great is one of the few who deserves that epithet, the one who deserves to be called the Great." The empire over which Cyrus ruled was the largest the ancient world had ever seen and may be to this day the largest empire ever. Topic: <inaudible> Religion and Philosophy. Topic: Though it is generally believed that Zarathustra's teachings maintained influence on Cyrus, S acts and policies, so far no clear evidence has been found to indicate that Cyrus practiced a specific religion. Pierre Bryant wrote that given the poor information we have, it seems quite reckless to try to reconstruct what the religion of Cyrus might have been. His views are believed expressed in the content of the cylinder. You me sa a ma hr alubal u alunabu s a a ra ku u m e e a li ta mu u lit ta's ka ru a ma a ta du un ki e a u a na alumertic belly e a li i q bu u sa m k u ra as sari pa li hai ka u m k a m bu z e a mari su. Cylinder, Akkadian language line, 35. 
Pray daily before Bel and Nabu for long life for me, and may they speak a gracious word for me and say to Marduk, my lord, May Cyrus, the king who worships you, and Cambyses, his son. Cylinder, English translation line, 35. The policies of Cyrus with respect to treatment of minority religions are well documented in Babylonian texts as well as Jewish sources and the historians' accounts. Cyrus had a general policy of religious tolerance throughout his vast empire. Whether this was a new policy or the continuation of policies followed by the Babylonians and Assyrians as Lester Grab maintains is disputed. He brought peace to the Babylonians and is said to have kept his army away from the temples and restored the statues of the Babylonian gods to their sanctuaries. His treatment of the Jews during their exile in Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar II destroyed Jerusalem is reported in the Bible. The Jewish Bible's Ketuvim ends in 2 Chronicles with the decree of Cyrus, which returned the exiles to the Promised Land from Babylon along with a commission to rebuild the temple. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord, the God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whosoever there is among you of all his people, the Lord, his God, be with him, let him go there. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verse 23 This edict is also fully reproduced in the book of Ezra. In the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree. Concerning the house of God at Jerusalem, let the temple, the place where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt and let its foundations be retained, its height being sixty cubits and its width sixty cubits, with three layers of huge stones and one layer of timbers. And let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. Also let the gold and silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be returned and brought to their places in the temple in Jerusalem, and you shall put them in the house of God." Ezra 6 verses 3–5 The Jews honored him as a dignified and righteous king. In one biblical passage, Isaiah refers to him as Messiah lit. His anointed one. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 1, making him the only Gentile to be so referred. Elsewhere in Isaiah, God is described as saying, I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness, I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or reward, says God Almighty. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 13 As the text suggests, Cyrus did ultimately release the nation of Israel from its exile without compensation or tribute. These particular passages Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, often referred to as Deutero Isaiah are believed by most modern critical scholars to have been added by another author toward the end of the Babylonian exile ca. 536 BC. Josephus, the first-century Jewish historian, relates the traditional view of the Jews regarding the prediction of Cyrus in Isaiah in his Antiquities of the Jews, Book 11, Chapter 1. In the first year of the reign of Cyrus, which was the seventieth from the day that our people were removed out of their own land into Babylon, God commiserated the captivity and calamity of these poor people, according as he had foretold to them by Jeremiah the prophet, before the destruction of the city, that after they had served Nebuchadnezzar and his posterity, and after they had undergone that servitude seventy years, he would restore them again to the land of their fathers, and they should build their temple, and enjoy their ancient prosperity. And these things God did afford them, for he stirred up the mind of Cyrus, and made him write this throughout all Asia. Thus saith Cyrus the king, since God Almighty hath appointed me to be king of the habitable earth, I believe that he is that God which the nation of the Israelites worship, for indeed he foretold my name by the prophets, and that I should build him a house at Jerusalem, in the country of Judea. This was known to Cyrus by his reading the book which Isaiah left behind him of his prophecies, for this prophet said that God had spoken thus to him in a secret vision. My will is, that Cyrus, whom I have appointed to be king over many and great nations, send back my people to their own land, and build my temple. This was foretold by Isaiah 140 years before the temple was demolished. Accordingly, when Cyrus read this, and admired the divine power, an earnest desire and ambition seized upon him to fulfill what was so written, so he called for the most eminent Jews that were in Babylon, and said to them, that he gave them leave to go back to their own country, and to rebuild their city Jerusalem, and the temple of God, for that he would be their assistant, and that he would write to the rulers and governors that were in the neighborhood of their country of Judea, that they should contribute to them gold and silver for the building of the temple, and besides that, beasts for their sacrifices. 
Cyrus was praised in the Tanakh, Isaiah chapter 45 verses 1 to 6 and Ezra chapter 1 verses 1 to 11 for the freeing of slaves, humanitarian equality and costly reparations he made. However, there was Jewish criticism of him after he was lied to by the Cuthites, who wanted to halt the building of the Second Temple. They accused the Jews of conspiring to rebel, so Cyrus in turn stopped the construction, which would not be completed until 515 BC, during the reign of Darius I. According to the Bible it was King Artaxerxes who was convinced to stop the construction of the temple in Jerusalem, Ezra chapter 4 verses 7-24. The historical nature of this decree has been challenged. Professor Lester L. Grab argues that there was no decree but that there was a policy that allowed exiles to return to their homelands and rebuild their temples. He also argues that the archaeology suggests that the return was a trickle, taking place over perhaps decades, resulting in a maximum population of perhaps 30,000. Philip R. Davies called the authenticity of the decree dubious. Citing Grab and adding that J. Breend argued against the authenticity of Ezra 1.1-4 as J. Breend, in a paper given at the Institut Catholique de Paris on 15 December 1993, who denies that it resembles the form of an official document but reflects rather biblical prophetic idiom. Mary Joan Wynne Leith believes that the decree in Ezra might be authentic and along with the cylinder that Cyrus, like earlier rules, was through these decrees trying to gain support from those who might be strategically important, particularly those close to Egypt which he wished to conquer. He also wrote that, "...appeals to Marduk in the cylinder and to Yahweh in the biblical decree demonstrate the Persian tendency to co-opt local religious and political traditions in the interest of imperial control." Some contemporary Muslim scholars have suggested that the Qur Anak figure of Dhul Qarnain is a mythological representation of Cyrus the Great. Dhul Qarnain, Arabic, Dhul Qarnain, IPA, Ulqarnajn, or Zulkarnain, he of the two horns, or figuratively, he of the two ages, appears in Surah 18 verses 83 101 of the Quran as a figure empowered by Allah to erect a wall between mankind and Gog and Magog, the representation of chaos. This theory was proposed by Sunni scholars such as Maulana Madudi and Abul Kalam Azad and endorsed by Shi. A scholar's Alama Tabatabai, in his Tafsir al Mizan and Makarim Shirazi. Topic. Politics and management Topic. Cyrus founded the empire as a multi state empire governed by four capital states Pasargadae, Babylon, Susa, and Igbatana. He allowed a certain amount of regional autonomy in each state, in the form of a satrapy system. A satrapy was an administrative unit, usually organized on a geographical basis. A satrap governor was the vassal king, who administered the region, a general supervised military recruitment and ensured order, and a state secretary kept the official records. The general and the state secretary reported directly to the satrap as well as the central government. During his reign, Cyrus maintained control over a vast region of conquered kingdoms, achieved through retaining and expanding the satrapies. Further organization of newly conquered territories into provinces ruled by satraps, was continued by Cyrus's successor Darius the Great. Cyrus's empire was based on tribute and conscripts from the many parts of his realm. Through his military savvy, Cyrus created an organized army including the Immortals Unit, consisting of 10,000 highly trained soldiers. He also formed an innovative postal system throughout the empire, based on several relay stations called Chapur Khana. Cyrus's conquests began a new era in the age of empire building, where a vast superstate, comprising many dozens of countries, races, religions, and languages, were ruled under a single administration headed by a central government. This system lasted for centuries, and was retained both by the invading Seleucid dynasty during their control of Persia, and later Iranian dynasties, including the Parthians and Sasanians. On December 10, 2003, in her acceptance of the Nobel Peace Prize, Shirin Abadi evoked Cyrus, saying, I am an Iranian, a descendant of Cyrus the Great. This emperor proclaimed at the pinnacle of power 2,500 years ago that he would not reign over the people if they did not wish it. He promised not to force any person to change his religion and faith and guaranteed freedom for all. 
The Charter of Cyrus the Great should be studied in the history of human rights. Cyrus has been known for his innovations in building projects, he further developed the technologies that he found in the conquered cultures and applied them in building the palaces of Pasargadae. He was also famous for his love of gardens. The recent excavations in his capital city has revealed the existence of the Pasargadae Persian Garden and a network of irrigation canals. Pasargadae was a place for two magnificent palaces surrounded by a majestic royal park and vast formal gardens, among them was the four quartered wall gardens of Paradisia, with over 1,000 metres of channels made out of carved limestone, designed to fill small basins at every 16 metres and water various types of wild and domestic flora. The design and concept of Paradisia were exceptional and have been used as a model for many ancient and modern parks. Ever since, the English physician and philosopher Sir Thomas Brown penned a discourse entitled The Garden of Cyrus in 1658, in which Cyrus is depicted as an archetypal, wise ruler while the protectorate of Cromwell ruled Britain. Cyrus the Elder brought up in woods and mountains, when time and power enabled, pursued the dictate of his education, and brought the treasures of the field into rule and circumscription. So nobly beautifying the hanging gardens of Babylon, that he was also thought to be the author thereof. Cyrus Cylinder One of the few surviving sources of information that can be dated directly to Cyrus's time is the Cyrus Cylinder Persian, Astuan Quirsh, a document in the form of a clay cylinder inscribed in Akkadian cuneiform. It had been placed in the foundations of the Esagila the Temple of Marduk in Babylon as a foundation deposit following the Persian conquest in 539 BC. It was discovered in 1879 and is kept today in the British Museum in London. The text of the cylinder denounces the deposed Babylonian king Nabonidus as impious and portrays Cyrus as pleasing to the chief god Marduk. It describes how Cyrus had improved the lives of the citizens of Babylonia, repatriated displaced peoples, and restored temples and cult sanctuaries. Although not mentioned specifically in the text, the repatriation of the Jews from their Babylonian captivity has been interpreted as part of this general policy. In the 1970s, the Shah of Iran adopted the Cyrus cylinder as a political symbol, using it as a central image in his celebration of 2,500 years of Iranian monarchy, and asserting that it was the first human rights charter in history. This view has been disputed by some as rather anachronistic and tendentious, as the modern concept of human rights would have been quite alien to Cyrus's contemporaries and is not mentioned by the cylinder. The cylinder has, nonetheless, become seen as part of Iran. Cultural identity. The United Nations has declared the relic to be an ancient declaration of human rights since 1971, approved by then Secretary General Sithu U Thant, after he was given a replica by the sister of the Shah of Iran. The British Museum describes the cylinder as an instrument of ancient Mesopotamian propaganda that reflects a long tradition in Mesopotamia where, from as early as the 3rd millennium BC, kings began their reigns with declarations of reforms. The cylinder emphasizes Cyrus's continuity with previous Babylonian rulers, asserting his virtue as a traditional Babylonian king while denigrating his predecessor, Neil McGregor, director of the British Museum, has stated that the cylinder was the first attempt we know about running a society, a state with different nationalities and faiths, a new kind of statecraft. He explained that it has even been described as the first declaration of human rights, and while this was never the intention of the document, the modern concept of human rights scarcely existed in the ancient world. It has come to embody the hopes and aspirations of many. Topic: <laughs> Family tree. Topic. See also. Topic. Cyrus the Great Portal. List of kings of Persia. K. Baman. Topic. References. Topic. Topic. Bibliography 
Topic. Topic. Further reading. Topic. Amelie Kurt, Ancient Near Eastern History: The Case of Cyrus the Great of Persia. In Hugh Godfrey Maturin Williamson, Understanding the History of Ancient Israel. Oxford University Press 2007, ISBN 978-0-19-726401-0, pp. 107-128 Bickerman, Elias J. September 1946. The Edict of Cyrus in Ezra Chapter 1. Journey of Biblical Literature. 65 249-275. Doi 10.2307/3262665. JSTOR 3262665. Doherty, Raymond Philip. 1929. Nabonidus and Belshazzar: A Study of the Closing Events of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. New Haven, Yale University Press. Drews, Robert. October 1974. Sargon, Cyrus, and Mesopotamian Folk History. Journal of Near Eastern Studies. 33 387-393. doi, 10.1086, 372377. Harmata, J. 1971. The Rise of the Old Persian Empire, Cyrus the Great. Acta Antiquo, 19-3-15. Lawrence, John M. 1985. Cyrus, Messiah, Politician, and General. Near East Archaeological Society Bulletin, N. S. 25 to 5 minus 28. Lawrence, John M. 1982. Neo Assyrian and Neo Babylonian attitudes towards foreigners and their religion. Near East Archaeological Society Bulletin, N. S. 1927 minus 40. Malawan, Max. 1972. Cyrus the Great, 558 to 529 BC. Iran, 10 1-17. Doi 10.2307/4300460. JSTOR 4300460. Wieshofer, Joseph. 1996. Ancient Persia, from 550 BC to 650 AD. Aziza Azadi, Trans. London, I. B. Tories. ISBN 1-85043-999-0. Jovi, Alexander I Am Cyrus, The Story of the Real Prince of Persia. Reading, Garnet Publishing. ISBN 978-1-85964-281-8. External links Topic. Cyrus Cylinder Full Babylonian Text of the Cyrus Cylinder as it was known in 2001, Translation, Brief Introduction Xenophon, Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus, translated by Henry Graham Dakins and revised by F. M. Stahl, Project Gutenberg. Cyrus the Great An article about Cyrus by Iran Chamber Society 360 Panoramic Image, Tomb of Cyrus the Great.